host and moderator and a co-presenter for today's session. I am the Vice President of Marketing for Rockford Systems. My co-presenter today is Mr. Roger Harrison, Director of Training with over 25,000 hours of machine safeguarding standards and regulations training under his belt and is a frequent speaker at the Precision Metal Forming Association, Fabtech, various safety councils, and other venues. So just a little bit about Rockford Systems before we jump into robotics. Rockford Systems provides turnkey safeguarding solutions for organizations working with industrial machinery, which includes robots. Our services range from training and education to risk and safeguarding assessments, installations, and post-sale support. Please visit us at rockfordsystems.com to learn more about us and follow us on social media. Okay, so let's move into our topic. Today, I will provide a brief overview of the robotics industry, then move into a discussion of current robot safety regulations and standards. These standards are complex and rapidly changing, so our goal is to ensure that webinar attendees leave today knowing what standards are current, what has recently been updated, and what changes are in the works. Then I will turn the presentation over to Roger, who will provide a more detailed review of different robot safeguarding techniques and application examples. Today's presentation is only a robot safeguarding primer and designed for a non-technical audience. So let's define what we're talking about as defined by ISO 8373-2012. A robot is an actuated mechanism programmable in two or more axes with a degree of autonomy moving within its environment to perform intended tasks. Today, there are over 2 million robots deployed in global factories, and that number is expected to exceed 3 million by 2020, representing a 14% compound annual growth rate, or CAGR, between 2018 and 2020. Broken down by sectors, around 70% of industrial robots are currently working in automotive, electrical, electronics, metal, and machinery industry segments. The vast majority of robots live in Asia, followed by Europe and America. Today, there are approximately 350,000 robots operating in American factories with robot density at 189 robots per 10,000 employees. The main driver of this growth is the ongoing trend to modernize factories and automate production in order to strengthen American industries in the global market and to keep manufacturing at home, and in some cases, to bring back manufacturing that had previously been sent overseas. So long story short, robots are here to stay. So what is a collaborative robot, or COBOT for short? Well, there is no global industry standard definition yet, but it is generally considered to be a robot designed to assist human beings as a guide or assister in a specific task. Cobots have been around since 1990s, but in recent years, advancement in sensors and automation technology, not to mention artificial intelligence or AI, have raised their profile quite substantially. A regular industrial robot is designed to be programmed to work more or less autonomously, Robots in industry have always been big, strong, robust devices that work on specific tasks designed for them. They're surrounded by fences and guards for safety purposes. Their bright colors were used to warn the surrounding workers about the danger they represented. And a lot of programming skills were necessary to bring up these industrial robots. Cobots, in fact, are the opposite. They are compact, lightweight, and have integrated sensors passive compliance or overcurrent detection of safety features. The integrated sensors will feel external forces and if this force is too high, the robot will stop its movement. The cobot space is growing rapidly, but it is only one-tenth of the size of the installed industrial robot space today. Experts predict that the cobot market will be worth over a billion dollars and some analysts predict 3.3 billion by 2020 
driven primarily by adoption in the automotive, metal and machining, furniture and equipment, food and beverage, and plastics industry. So if you're a regular on our monthly webinar series, you know that we typically report on hundreds and thousands of injuries associated with traditional metalworking machines. But the number of reported robot injuries and fatalities is actually relatively low. However, even one fatality is still too many. OSHA reports 38 robot-related accidents since 1984, of which 27 have resulted in death. The sources of hazards include human errors, control errors, unauthorized access, mechanical failures, environmental sources, power systems, and installation issues. And the types of accidents are typically impact or collision related, crushing and trapping, or other types of accidents. And the fines and lawsuits associated with a robot injury or fatality can be staggering. Within the last year, the U.S. Department of Labor filed a $2.6 million lawsuit against an auto parts supplier when a 20-year-old woman was crushed to death while clearing a sensor fault in a robotic conveyor belt. And incidentally, there have been no major incidents reported with cobots. So most robot accidents do not occur under normal operating conditions, but rather during everything else, such as programming, adjustment, testing, cleaning, um, and inspection. During many of these operations, the operator is temporarily entering the robot work envelope while the power is available to movable elements of the robot system. Okay, so now we're gonna move into robot safety regulations and standards. And a good place to start is actually to ask the question, who is responsible for robot safety? Well, it's really everybody all together, all stakeholders, starting with the manufacturer. The OEM is bound by ANSI RIA R15.06-2012 in part one, which is entitled Industrial Robots. The integrator and the installer is bound by ANSI RA R15.06-2012 Part 2, entitled Industrial Robot Systems. So the key difference here is industrial robots versus industrial robot systems, and we will talk a little bit about that difference in just a moment. The manufacturer, integrator, and installer have the requirement to provide information for use to the user of the robot and robot system. And the user, although not specifically defined in the standard, has the responsibility to use this information in developing training and safe work practices. So it's really a combined effort of all stakeholders. Safety must be a conscious effort on the part of all parties throughout the life cycle of the robot, starting with the initial design and continuing through integration, implementation, use, maintenance, and ultimately culminating in disposal. So let's go back to the definitions <clears throat> in R15.06 and also ISO 10218. The definitions for industrial robot are the robot arm plus the robot controller. Robot arm, robot controller is the industrial robot. Notice there is no end effector there and no workpiece. This is the robot, and this is the subject of part one. The industrial robot system is the subject of part two, and includes the robot, as we've just seen, plus the end effector, plus the workpiece, plus any peripheral equipment, such as safeguarding, jigs, etc. The end effector, workpiece, and peripheral equipment are determined based upon the application or what the robot is intended to accomplish, which is very important when we start to talk about cobots. So in terms of regulations, which of course are mandatory, there are no specific robot regulations within OSHA, but robots and robotic systems must comply with OSHA 29 CFR 1910.333, 
on selection and use of work practices and also OSHA 29 CFR 1910.147 on control of hazardous energy or blackout tagout. Standards are voluntary, but remember that OSHA frequently looks to standards when regulations do not exist in an area. So when we look at the major standards organizations, there are several key players, including the American National Standards Institute, or ANSI, which is the U.S. standards body, and then two international organizations, International Organization for Standardization, ISO, and the International Electrotechnical Commission, IEC. The work in this area of robot safety was primarily done at the international level, i.e., ISO 10218, parts one and two, then brought home for U.S. adoption to fulfill a goal of international harmonization. So in effect, ISO 10218, parts one and two, uh, which was created in 2011, is the same thing as ANSI RIA R15.06, 2012. So due to this international harmonization, if you're compliant with R1506, you're also largely compliant with other country standards that harmonize with ISO, such as the Canadian standard CSA Z434. So the R1506 2012 standard is a complete revision of the 1999 version. Some of the important changes to the 2012 standard included mandatory risk assessments for both robots and cobots. And let me say that again, mandatory risk assessments for both robots and cobots. Requirements for cobot operation and much more. The new 2012 requirements are not applicable to robots manufactured or robot systems installed prior to the publication as long as they were compliant with the 1999 version. However, robots that were physically moved or installations that have changed after 1999 should undergo a review that they remain compliant, and as always, a risk assessment is the best option for that review. And a new standard is in development called ANSI RAA R15.08, which deals with industrial mobile robot safety. So the key word here being mobile, mobile bases. This standard is expected to debut sometime before 2020. So there you have it. Okay. There are also several ANSI registered technical reports, or TRs, which are supplemental to ANSI RIA R15.06 2012 and are intended to be applied in conjunction with the requirements outlined in the standard. The information contained in the technical reports is informative, meaning written with words like should, whereas the standard itself is normative and written with words like shall. So, <clears throat> just to go through these quickly, TR-306, is the technical report that is all about task-based risk assessments. Technical report 406 is all about robot safeguarding. Technical report 506, existing systems. And technical report 606, which was just issued in 2016, is all about collaborative robot safety. Please note that the task-based um, technical report 306 was revised in 2016. So make sure that you're on the current version of these technical reports. So the TR-606, which was issued again in 2016, is actually the same thing as ISO TS-15066-2016. So those are interchangeable as well. The first version of R1506 was written in the 80s, and at that time, the traditional robot approach was that the robot is fixed, mounted in place, and doing something that could potentially be dangerous to humans, such as welding or painting. So most tasks 
involving robot movement based upon these assumptions, our main safety concern is keeping operators away from the restricted space or the swept volume of where the fully extended robot arm could potentially reach while in operation. So to keep the humans safe, we kept them out of that area. And the easiest way to do that is to create a safeguarded space. So in this example, we see, sorry. So in this example, we see a perimeter guard installed on all four sides of the work cell, which again is designed to keep the human out of the safeguarded space. Now, there are going to be some times when the, human, when the human needs to enter the safeguarded space, such as to perform maintenance, testing, clear jam, etc. In those situations, we can safeguard the work cell using sensitive protection equipment or SPE, such as pressure sensitive mats and light curtains. Once the human trips to safeguarding, either by breaking the light curtain beam or stepping on a safety mat, the safeguarding equipment will turn off the robot so the human can enter the area safely. This is just one example of potential SPE equipment that can achieve this goal. But what happens when the human and the robot need to interact? In R1506, the standard permits both collaborative and mobile robot systems, but does not go into great detail about how to achieve these safely. That's why TR606 is so important because it represents a paradigm shift whereby the human and the robot system can interact safely together in a shared workspace because collaborative robot systems will have built-in safety capabilities that reduce risks to the human worker. So why is it TR-606 so important? Um, well, basically, a lot of this information was included in a variety of documents, and TR-606 really pulls it all together in one handy document and includes definition of collaborative robot operation, safety-related control systems, factors for the design of the collaborative robot system, uh, built-in safety-related systems for collaborative operation and requirements for their use, including how to implement a, cl a collaborative application using the following techniques. So these four um, here are actually four different types of cobots, uh, safety-rated monitored stop, can guiding, speed and separation monitoring, and the most common, power and force limiting, otherwise known as PFL cobots. And everything basically shown in pink is what is show what is new information that was included in TR-606. So we're not going to get into the, the um, details behind the difference in these four types of cobots, um, just so you know that they, there are different types of cobots. So again, <clears throat> um, this chart was presented by Roberta Nelson Shea at NRSC and shows the four different types of collaborative robots, safety rated monitored, stop hand guided, speed and separation monitoring, and PFL, and their benefits versus traditional industrial robots. Risk assessments need to be performed on cobots, and depending upon the results of the risk assessments, you may need to safeguard your cobot in high-risk applications. Confusion definitely exists on the topic of safeguarding cobots. In fact, the industry is not even settled yet on a definition of what is a collaborative robot. Most people using the term collaborative robot are referring to what the industry standard prefers to call power and force limiting robots. But here again, power and force limiting robots is just one type of cobot. It is not the whole cobot category. <clears throat> But at the time that TS-15066 was uh, being created and published, that was really primarily the only type of cobot around, and so there is confusion in this area. The PFL robots typically have most, if not all, of the following characteristics. Limited payload.
payload capacity, limited size and mass of the robot arm, limits placed on the pressure the robot arm can exert at its joints, rounded edges and corners, soft compliant surfaces, easy to program, integrate and move, easy to hand guide, and more. So much of the buzz about collaborative robots is really buzz on PSL robots, and it's all about how thing is safe right out of the box. Well, it may be the case that the PSL robot arm by itself is safe right out of the box, but this is not necessarily true about the robot once it has been integrated into a complete system. So understanding the application and the operation are critical to understanding the need to safeguard. So remember that the robot arm by itself cannot do any work. It must be integrated with an end effector and other relevant equipment and machinery in order to do a given task on a workpiece, which all must be appropriate for collaborative operation in order for us to say whether the overall robot system is collaborative. By appropriate, we mean the power and forces it can exert are such that a human would not be harmed even if incidental contact occurred. So I find this example to be helpful. So if the PSL robot arm would be juggling knives, that's not an appropriate application for a collaborative operation. Obviously, that's dangerous. There should be other safeguards in place to keep the human worker safe. And those other safeguards are the same ones that you would use with a traditional industrial robot, such as physical fencing, light curtains, pressure mats, and so on. Or sometimes the collaborative is appropriate but only at a low speed because higher speeds would cause a greater force to be exerted at the point of contact such that the greater force exceeds the permitted force limits. If the user company would like the system to operate at faster speeds to enhance productivity, then PSL robots would need to be fitted with safeguards. So the bottom line is that it is really your risk assessment of the overall robot system that will tell you whether or not the system is in fact appropriate for collaborative use, even if it is using a PSL robot arm. And if not, what safeguards should be put in place to protect the human workers nearby. And that's why a risk assessment is required even for a collaborative robot system. And remember, every situation is unique. So this slide just shows you a little bit more about uh, risk assessment, which again is um, CR 306. And by the way, you can purchase the standard R1506 and all of the technical reports on the uh, Robotics Industry Association RIA website, which is robotics.org. You can purchase them all together in what they call the safety bundle. So in TR306, it describes a task-based risk assessment. So at each stage of development of the robot and the robot system, a risk assessment should be performed that identifies not only the tasks, but also the hazards and then creates a task hazard pairs, which would be different for every robot in the system. And then the appropriate level of, of safeguarding would be determined by what the risk assessment says. So the risk assessment is looking at the severity of injury, the exposure to the hazard, and the avoidance of the hazard, and creates these task hazard pairs, which ultimately then will define the risk level. So once the risk level has been defined, if it is high or very high, you may need to deploy some more aggressive risk reduction technologies, such as like curtains, guards, interlocks, and so on. If the risk level is low or negligible, um, you may need to deploy some less aggressive um, risk reduction solutions such as um, signs or PPE or training. So it really all depends on what the risk assessment says. Okay, so now I'm going to turn this over to Roger, who will get into uh, some very specific robot safeguarding examples and um, provide some application expertise.
Good morning. My name is Roger Harrison. I'm the director of training for Rockford Systems. So we do uh, monthly training seminars here at our training center in Rockford, Illinois, as well as classes on the road uh, and occasionally webinars like this one. I started with reading the 1999 Industrial Robot Standard R1506 back then. And uh, that's where I learned a lot about robot safeguarding techniques. I think that was probably the most valuable of the standards that I'm going to mention that I uh, use for that purpose. And it is still available from the Robotic Industries Association, I'm talking about the 1999 version. Uh, <clears throat> that was updated in 2012, and it's a much larger document, most of which is uh, on risk assessment one way or the other. There's a little bit on safeguarding in there, but I think the best update for me for this topic of safeguarding was the technical report, uh, TR15, I'm sorry, TR15.406-2014. Safeguarding Industrial Robots, because that is a smaller standard again and has a lot of information on both guards and devices, if you want to just take the two main areas. Now, if we look at the list here, um, they, they're talking about fixed, non-interlocked, interlocked, and locking perimeter guards, because the basis for safeguarding a robot is based on a perimeter guard. Sensitive protective equipment, you've already heard that term this morning and what Terry covered, uh, and it's broken down into electrical sensitive protective equipment and active optoelectronic protective equipment, uh, which is sometimes described as, as an active optical protective device like a light curtain, and also applies to other machines like, for instance, laser devices on press brakes as an example. Uh, if you come further down, there's an enabling devices mentioned here. You have to hold one control to the other control to function. Doing controls, which is usually just single cycle the machine because those are now used for safeguarding on robots. They now refer to safeguarding in some places in this, these standards as a risk reduction method instead of using the term safeguarding. The two basic principles of safeguarding a robot, and these go back to the 1999 standard that I mentioned, our top left corner to prevent the operator from being in the restricted space during automatic operation. That's what the perimeter guard is all about. And in the bottom left corner, stop the robot motion while any part of the operator's body is in restricted space. Those two things I'm guessing in looking at this robot uh, enclosure are probably pretty well covered. Two different types of stop functions are defined in the uh, 2012 standard. Emergency stop, which we're all familiar with, to stop all the robot motion and other hazard, hazardous functions at the cell or between cells or other work areas of the workspace. Okay, we know about e-stops. As opposed to protective stop circuits, which are for the connection of external protective devices such as infrared light curtains, laser scanners, guard interlocks, and so on. Now, as far as cables for emergency stop, also known as grab wire cables, those can be little short lengths like you see on the left side or much longer lengths that go into an automation cell, maybe turn the corner with a pulley and go several different directions before they terminate at the other end. So those can go quite a difference. I've seen it go as far as uh, 200 feet as opposed to emergency stop buttons, which are more, more common on a lot of different machines which have to be, we're summarizing here, several different um, regulations or standards that say these. Red in color, one per operating station, meaning if you have more than one operating station, you need more than one red emer emergency stop button. Mushroom shape, you don't want little tiny red emergency stop buttons, but something that's pretty good size. It's gotta be labeled as e-stop, gotta be readily accessible to wherever the operator's working, and that could be more than one operator, meaning more than one e-stop. A yellow background is what indicates an emergency stop from any other stop. And a manual latch feature, so when you push the button down, it latches in the engaged position, like the one in the lower left corner down here. To release it, in this case, you give it a quarter turn clockwise, it pops back out to the reset position so that you can go back to the regular controls to start up the machine or robot, whatever it happens to be. 
And now releasing a red emergency stop, as I think we're all aware, does not initiate any hazardous motion. The one on the far right hand side is a little more heavy duty, still the red button, yellow background with a manual latch. So when you push the red button down, the latch pops out so you can use that hull as part of your lockout tagout procedure, certainly not all of it. So the main safety standard look at to see what we've summarized here would be the National Fire Protection Association. 79 is the number, 2015 is the latest update. That's the electrical standard for industrial machines. Now, grab wire cables can also be used on conveyors, which of course are conveyors are also used with robots, as we'll see later. So you can exchange, or I shouldn't say exchange, but instead of using buttons, ready stop buttons, you can use cables that cover a long length, whether it's a conveyor or processing line, whatever it might be. Notice on the right side, there's a reset uh, switch, and there are warning or danger signs that have little pictograms on it, little drawings depicting what the hazard is. So on the left side at the bottom there, they talk about conveyors that start up automatically requiring an audible or visual warning device. Span of control is a term used in that safeguarding technical report that I mentioned before. In fact, this is taken from that report and shows three different span of control stop buttons. One at the top left here for emergency stop, one in the center right here, and one over on the right-hand side. So if that has to be, if you look up at the top here, uh, marked with placards or visual indicators to show what the span of control is for each of the three emergency stop buttons so you know what you're stopping when you hit that button. So safeguarding on robots is typically a combination of safeguarding devices. I say devices because that also includes the perimeter guard that goes around the outside of it, which again is the basis for safeguarding and automation cell. Uh, so we start with the uh, light curtains, the lower right corner there, and we have grab wire cables. And moving up the side here, we got actual actuator operated interlocks, magnetic interlocks. Over on the left side here, rotary interlocks, point of operation light curtains, pressure sensitive mats, see more interlocks, solenoid locking interlocks, and those need to all go back to some sort of uh, safety input, which in this case, the lower right corner is referred to an output signal switching device. So if something's going along and automatic, all of a sudden it stops, you have to know which um, safeguarding or which stop device to reset. In other words, did somebody accidentally step in the area where we have an area laser scanner? Did they hit that emergency stop button or this one? Did they open up an interlock door or break the uh, point of operation light curtain? You really don't know unless it gives you an indicator. Here we got another combination of safeguarding. Four different light curtains. That's two up at the top here for the conveyors to come through and two down on this side. Uh, we've also got two interlocked full body access doors, one on each side. Uh, we've got area laser scanners in each of the four corners. Now it's significant that everything that's inside the safeguarding space is mounted on something with skinny legs. Because remember, when the laser reaches out, it leaves a shadow behind it. And skinny legs do not create as much of a shadow as, say, the base of the robot did if it were mounted on the floor. In order to let product in and out of that safeguarded space, <clears throat> yes, they can use a light curtain like this. Some companies elect to use a guard with a small opening at the bottom that allows for the product only. But what if the dimensions of that load vary from one job to another? Well, that's where we've installed, and I don't have a picture of it here, a sliding vertical guard. It slides up and down on the track, meaning you can adjust the size of the opening underneath it. Other companies have fabricated a tunnel for the product to go through, but again, that's usually limited to something where you always use the same size product going through. There are smart light curtains, been out there a number of years now, that can distinguish the difference between the car body going through this horizontal light curtain, like the top left corner, versus somebody walking through it, like the one down here, based on the pattern of beams that's broken. Smart light curtains. 
area laser scanners have been around since 1994. I think SIG Automation was the first one to manufacture these. There are other companies that offer these as well. Let's say we've got SIG, we've got um, Omron STI, we've got Keyens, we've got Banner, or four of them that I'm aware of. Um, <clears throat> I've highlighted some of the ones that I happen to have seen out there, like automatic assembly machines at the top, like uh, horizontal tube benders, press bolster guard. Now I say bolster guarding on a press because actually this device is not a high enough safety category to match a, uh, say, a Category 4 light curtain that's used for point of operation safeguarding. This is only, you know, a, a one category underneath that. And the reason for that is both the transmitter and receiver are in one housing, which is not the case with light curtains. And we go down to the bottom. Automatically guided vehicles is where this all began. AGVs, which, by the way, do have an ANSI standard of their own right here. Uh, and then general safety mat replacement. A lot of pressure sensitive mats get damaged by fork trucks and chemicals. And so these are usually tucked away in a little smaller um, target for things like that. Not that they can't be damaged, but uh, you got to remember these are reprogrammable with your laptop out on the shop floor. So if your parameters change, it's easy to change your parameters on an area laser scanner. Three terms you hear a lot with area laser scanners, sometimes referred to as safety laser scanners, uh, or floor scanners is another name for them. One is a plane of detection, which is usually somewhere between ankle height and shin height they mount these so that people can't sneak underneath them. Angle of rotation goes anywhere from 180 degrees to 275 degrees, uh, depending on what it was manufactured to be. There's an angle of rotation. Uh, you can even put two of these back to back to get a full circle. That's why they overlap with the with the uh, angles a little bit. Uh, angle of rotation. Let's see. Time of flight. When the laser itself leaves this device, bounces off an object and comes back, determines the distance away that that object is to the scanner. So as far as laser classes, if you're familiar with those, this is a class one laser which is very, uh, you know, safe, relatively safe. If you were the guy that's down on the floor lining this thing up, you wouldn't, you know, be bothered by this laser hitting you in the face, even sweeping across the eyes because it's such a low category. Uh, it's an IEC type three or four. Now, I don't think I, I uh, check this out. I don't think there's any category fours, only threes out there because of what I explained before both the transmitter and the receiver are in one enclosure. And to be a Category 4, like some of the light curtains are, you've got to have a separate transmitter and a separate receiver, two separate enclosures. The safety integrity level is only a 2 as compared to, let's say, a 3 on a light curtain. So these compared to light curtains, which a lot of people ask us about in our seminars, um, require more safety distance than a light curtain because they don't react as fast as so their reaction time. Uh, again, the category is lower, like the sill level, and they're two to three times more expensive than light curtains. So there are limited applications with these, especially when you're talking point of operation safeguarding. So here's a laptop you can program, and as I said before, reprogram if your parameters change right out on the shop floor with your laptop. They began in automation situations like you see here. Some of these go back to the 1990s. Notice, like, for instance, at the lower left here, they painted a line on the floor where the pattern actually comes out to uh, off the laser scan. So you know not to step inside of that uh, and accidentally trip the system. Uh, up at the top center, there's another one where the floor line was painted here. Down in the lower right corner, you've got area laser scanners being used in conjunction with vertical light curtains on a, a bending brake, press brake. So, basically, you've got two applications. You've got area guarding, like you see on the left side, and access guarding, like you see on the right side. The most, uh, most of the applications that I've seen are on the left side with area guarding, where they're horizontally mounted, like the one down here in the lower left corner. Now, the dark shadow represents the fault zone. The light shadow represents the warning zone, which in the case of this laser scanner, 
Uh, the fault zone can go out as far as 13 feet. The warning zone can go out as far as 39 feet. So if the operator steps into the warning zone, it flashes a light or beeps a horn to warn him he's getting in there and slows the robot down to a slower speed. If he continues and gets into the fault zone, the darker shading down here, that sends a stop signal to the guarded robot. So two different zones you can adjust, and no, it does not have to be a rectangle or a semicircle. It can be a lot of different patterns. The one at the top is similar, but there's two zones. It's actually split with an A and a B zone. The one on the right-hand side for access guarding, notice this is mounted vertically, and as I said before, more safety distance required than a light curtain because it's a slower reaction time. It's a lower safety category. Therefore, some machines like power presses, for instance, they cannot be used as a primary safeguarding device, whereas, whereas a light curtain could. And they're two to three times more expensive than a good Category 4 light curtain. I say Category 4 because that's usually top of the line when you're talking about light curtains. That's a Kians area laser scanner right here. You can see the dark shading is the fault zone, and the light shading on the outside edge is the warning zone. So you got to think of an area laser scanner as like a bicycle wheel. It starts in the center where the spokes are close together and the spokes get further away, the further out you go. That's how it's designed. Common robot accidents, people getting struck by the end effector or pinned between the end effector and a solid object is the reason for uh, the 20 inch rule. It used to be the 18 inch rule when the uh, robot arm stretched fully uh, as far as it could go. Uh, to the end of the end effector, I might say. You need at least 20 inches clear from any solid object that could squash somebody. That's based on studies done in Sweden and Japan years ago. So the 18-inch rule has become the 20-inch rule. You'll find it under Clause 5.5.2 under Access for Interventions. Remember that the word envelopes, the robot used to have three envelopes. Now they've changed the name to robot spaces. You've got maximum, restricted, and operating. Maximum is all possible movement, including the end effector. Restricted is that portion of the maximum space restricted by limiting devices, which we're going to go on to discuss, because limiting devices are actually part of the safeguarding. And on the right-hand side, the operating space is that portion of the restricted space the robot actually uses during its programmed motions, not forgetting the dimensions of the load, by the way. Notice in the center, in yellow here, the safeguarding is usually interfaced to the restricted space, the middle one. Now, limiting devices, what are they? Well, again, it's under means for limiting motion, and there's two types. You've got mechanical limiting devices, like hard stops on the base or waist of the robot. And you've got non-mechanical devices, like, uh, for instance, the pull plugs on the arms and elbows here. So if the robot goes beyond its restricted space, it's a middle one, remember pulls a plug, cuts a drive power, stops a robot. Um, people think, well, I've got a hard stop on this thing. It'll stop anything. Uh, no. No, it won't. I've heard of customers in our seminar to having discussions among themselves how their uh, six-axis robot blew right through a hard stop. So, you know, don't think those are the end all with that. Robotically fed presses. Yeah, here's a uh, fenced perimeter. And uh, there are interlocked doors to get in there. I'm not sure what's around the other side, but you can see the robot right in the center here. This was a John Deere plant where they had robots on both sides, one to feed a rectangular part into the press. The press made one deep draw hit and produced a mower deck, a riding mower deck, which was removed on the other side. So going back here, you see we have a fence perimeter around it, which met all the requirements for interlocks and so on. Um, plus, when somebody had to manually be in there, if you look very closely here, there's a series of light curtains right here, sort of an L shape to give you protection if you had to be in that space inside the fence. And there's your removal robot on the other side. You're probably all familiar with this. It's the OSHA guard opening scale to show that in this case, a woman of size six glove, uh, this is based on, can only reach a certain distance through that guard opening. So somebody says to you, what's the largest opening that OSHA recognizes for guards? It's right here, 
a six inch opening 31 and a half inches away. For those of you with a metal, plastic, wood, whatever guard opening scales, you notice that last segment usually does not show up because it would make it such an awkward size. I think there's a few that do, but remember that is your largest OSHA acceptable opening for a size six glove. Um, that came from a 1948 study with Liberty Mutual Insurance and the ANSI Standard Writing Committee for I think it was ANSI B11-1, um, which produced a measurement scale that you can use like that. And that's what OSHA uses. State or federal OSHA around the country uses that scale only, which came out in 1948, long before OSHA, I might add. Then in 1996, the same two groups got together and made a revised scale based on a woman's size four glove with average finger length. Oddly enough, that was because of a study they did that showed there was more Asian women in the workplace that had very small hands. So that came out in 1996, and is oftentimes your first referred to as the ANSI guard opening scale because it's more conservative based on a smaller hand size. Oddly enough, the robot standard talked about the technical report that came out in 2014, talks about square and slotted openings in these two drawings and is a match for neither one of those two guard opening scales. It's based on an ISO standard came out of Europe, and I think it's an in-between hand size. As far as the yellow framework on guarding, like uh, the bottom right one has yellow framework uh, because it was painted that way. The top left one here has snap-in yellow plastic channels. They're going to be aluminum extrusions to make your guard into a yellow framework guard if you want to do that. That came from uh, an ANSI Z535 color coding standard as a best practice. It's not an OSHA issue to have yellow framework on your guarding. Uh, replacing polycarbonate every two to three years is out there under, well, if you look at ANSI B1119, the safe guarding method standard from 2010, uh, they suggest doing that, especially if your polycarbonate comes in contact with industrial fluids, cutting fluids, and even sunlight will degrade the, degrade the impact protection of polycarbonate over time, especially when you've got somebody standing right behind this or in front of this, whatever you want to say, um, because that's obviously the highest um, category of protection that you want to provide when somebody's face is behind this. Perimeter guarding on a robot cell with conveyors. Well, let's see. All right. See the robot in there. Uh, what I'm concerned about is down here. There's at the bottom right corner here, there's a fence that appears to be maybe 12 inches from the floor, which according to current standards is not high enough. Low enough, all right? <laughs> Six inches from the floor should be the max. Six to seven inches at the bottom, but not 12 inches. The one that up here, uh, that looks to be within six inches would be my guess, looking at it. Uh, so, uh, let's see, the top uh, line here. A 12-inch sweep, that's the rail at the bottom, the distance from there to the floor, was what was prescribed back in 1999, the robot standard then, with a 60-inch height. Okay, then Canada came along, and Canada usually follows European standards to say, 2003 that you should have no more than six inches at the bottom, which has been backed up by several insurance companies that have been to our seminars and saying, hey, we've had fatalities, people climbing underneath 12 inches. Why? Because they start up the robot, and automatic, they everything, everything is set to go, and oh, they left their setup sheet on a clipboard inside the safeguarded space. I don't want to go through doing all this stuff to get in there legitimately. I just sneak under the fence because I can see it. It's only a couple feet in here. And then the robot comes, you know, pivots around to do unexpected, like if you dress a welding tip or whatever, and, you know, gets some squashes in between the end effector and something. So that's why Canada went to follow the European standards with a six inch sweep opening at the bottom and also increased the height from 60 to 72 inches because robots can, maybe in an emergency stop situation, release a part from the end effector and throw it with a lot of velocity. So making the fence higher is not for people crawling over the top, but stuff being thrown from the end effect that doesn't have a retention method to prevent it from doing that. So here's a Canadian standard, six inches at the bottom, 72 inches 
at the top. And I know being a custom guard manufacturer like we are, a lot of people have gone to 84, another foot height on the guard for that very reason. Now, if we look at the technical report from 2014, they're specifying seven inches at the bottom and a 55 inch height with a condition down at the bottom that protective heights greater than 55 inches are required for applications if the robot and defectors don't have effective part retention or if the hazard can be accessed by reach over the guard. Now, where that came from, I really don't know because in 1999, you're saying 60 inches, you know, Canada and uh, Europe have gone to 72, and here they're going back to 55. I don't know why that is, but it's it's in there like that. Robotically fat brass with light curtains, I mean guards and light curtains around it. Okay, we can see some of the fence height issues here. Uh, how about this one? This was a, a local manufacturing plant, at least local to us, that uh, was welding wheel wells with a robotic cell. First of all, the cell is relatively small in real estate for the size of the robot. Um, they claim that was because of the pull plugs on the arms and elbows, as we mentioned before. They also had hard stops on the base. I think that has since increased as far as the size of the real estate because of the concern that a robot could blow through a hard stop. But at that time, that's what was going on. Um, this has two light curtains. You take a look on the right-hand side, this light curtain is muted so that an operator can load a part onto a fixture over here. Whereas this light curtain is active because the robot is welding the wheel well. So this is active. When the welding is done, this robot I'm sorry, this light curtain is turned off so the operator can change positions. He can come over, initiate the cycle with the two hand controls and switch over to the left side. So we've got a fence perimeter. We've got limiting devices of both types. We've got light curtains, two of them. We've got a set of two hand controls and we've got a partial guard at the bottom because if you take a close look over here, about 12 inches of the light curtain is taped off or blanked out which would not provide any safeguarding unless they put the 12 inch high piece of fencing, which they did. Note that both the interlocks and the emergency stop have a key switch. Well, they explained it to me here that when they needed to initiate an emergency stop through this push button, this latched in the locked position. They could not reset it without a supervisor's key. The supervisor came over, unlocked it, and then popped it back to the reset position, allowed people to go back to the regular controls to start it up. Because what they wanted to do is to document what, what caused the emergency stop. We've also got key switches on the interlocks, which could be used in several different ways. One of which is to leave the latch in the extended position so you can't shut the door. You can't shut the door until you have a key to unlock this. There are other possibilities as well as to why or how they use the key. Trapped key interlock switches involve a swapping of keys. If they exchange keys for ho however many people are involved before you can start up the robot, again, trapped key systems. Robots sometimes have pneumatic systems that need to be, um, well, filter out the water and contaminants, control the air supply, maybe add lubrication to the airline to minimize the scale and stuff that you get if you run an airline dry. So FRLs. Think of uh, on other machines or sometimes using a robot, along with a three-quarter inch manual air lockout device like this one. And there are variations of that, but that's what's going on there so they can use that for lockout. Robots loading and unloading parts on the conveyors. Okay. Um, the only thing that if you take a look at this here, uh, there's no perimeter guard or fence around this which is sort of the basis, as we said before, for robot safeguarding is to have a perimeter guard plus whatever else you want to use. So I can see a light curtain up here and some partial guarding in association with that conveyor, but again, perimeter guards like this. There's perimeter guards that completely surround three different presses 
um, you know, perimeter guards oftentimes used where there's no individual safeguarding on the machines within the guard. Emergency stops required on both the main controller and the teach pendant has been in there a long time. I think that goes back to the 1999 standard. Karen? Okay, thank you, Roger. Very informative. Okay, if you have any additional questions about anything that you've seen here today, please feel free to email me, carrie.halley at rockgridsystems.com, and we will get right back to you. We also would like to invite you to our next mini webinar in March, which will be on press break and power press safeguarding, March 13th, 10 o'clock Central Time. You can find the information about that on our website and register for that. So again, thank you and have a great day.